Have you ever held a grudge against someone? Is forgiveness something you struggle with? Pastor Terry tackles this subject in the second segment of our series, The Spirit Form Son. Today's sermon is entitled, Walking in the Spirit of Forgiveness. Let's join Pastor Terry in the sanctuary as he presents this message. Well, this particular sermon is it's actually two parts. And, uh, but when I say two parts, it's all in one day, so I'll make it, I don't say it's going to be real long, but I'm just saying it's two parts. If you would, I'm going to take notes if you want, but the scripture is going to come up here and I'm going to read it. This is found in Luke 7. It says this, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. And when a certain immoral woman from that city heard that he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. Well, in this particular uh, story, there's three different characters I want us to study. One is the uh, admitted sinner. The first one is the admitted sinner. We look at this woman, something about this woman. The Bible says that everyone knew that she was a sinner. Kind of like the scarlet letter. We all know there's certain people in our town, and certain people, it's like, yeah, yeah, you know them. They're the sinners, you know. I remember talking about certain people, like, you don't want to go near that place. They'll bury you in their woods. Don't go near that. Everyone knows the notorious sinful people, don't we? And it's so easy. But this particular woman, she also knew that she was a sinful girl as well. If you study the, the order of this in the scriptures before, in Matthew 11, it says this. Jesus gave this sermon. And so I think that she probably got saved at this sermon, that she gave her life. She trusted Jesus with faith in him. And this is what the sermon says. In this particular sermon, Jesus says, Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Do you know that sin is a very heavy burden? Yeah, praise God it's a heavy burden. And if you have children who are living in sin, you say, Lord, make it heavy ever on them ever than ever before. Make it heavy upon them so they feel the weight of sin. Protect their lives that can make him heavy. This woman felt heavy. She knew it. And so she looked at Jesus, and she followed Jesus after hearing this sermon. She goes, I, I love you, Lord. I trust you, God. Perhaps that's when she turned from her sins. So she, she gave evidence. What evidence did she give that she was surrendered, that she, her heart was changed? Well, number one, she was crying. There was an attitude of humility. She was wiping his feet with her hair. I mean, you just don't do that, you know what I'm saying, unless you're a very humble person. They think pretty lowly of you. And she also brought expensive gift. Whatever she could, her heart wanted to show, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. And so that's what we see here. Now I'm going to continue on in the scripture, and this is found in Luke 7. Still continue on with the same story. When the, Pharisees, when the Pharisee who had invited him, Jesus, saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. I like it. It even puts an explanation point. This guy is like, that's a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. <laughs> he did not say this. He was thinking this. Can you imagine? I mean, lots of people wanted to follow Jesus. Well, with my mind, I probably think, I'm staying as far away from that guy as possible. I don't want him to expose who Terry Baldwin really is. You know what I'm talking about? I remember that fear when they had pastors come up here and say, you, young man, come here. It's like, oh, he knows what I'm thinking. God does those things. God does those things. And God saw this Pharisee's thoughts in his heart. And uh, it says, Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Well, go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned two people 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces of silver to the other. But then neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debt. Now, who do you suppose loved him more after that? And Simon answered, well, I suppose the one who, whom he, he canceled the largest debt. That is right, Jesus said. Okay, now here's our second host. First one was the other one, uh, the lady. And what we found about her was that she knew she was an admitted sinner. Amen? She knew it. And she went to Jesus. Here we find this guy who had a, he was a critical host. Simon was a critical host. Simon was embarrassed of this woman. It says right here, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is touching him. She's a sinner. Jesus must be a fraud. Jesus must not really be a prophet. But then Jesus proved he was a prophet by answering his thoughts in his head. 
So we have a guy here who he could only see this woman's sins. He, he only knew about her sins. He could easily see those things, but he couldn't see his own sins. He wasn't aware of those things. He was actually, Simon was blind to who Jesus was, who this woman was, and what was going on at the moment, even to Simon. Simon's real problem was blindness. It's easy to say, that's a sinner. That's a sinner. It's easy to say that, but it's not very easy to, to say, uh, to be aware of your own sin, is it? I'm serious. We, we, sometimes we know of our little ones, but there's things that we just kind of have blocked out that they are sins that we have totally blind ourselves to. So the story is not about the amount of a person's sin. This story is about the awareness of your own heart. Let me say that again. This story is not about who sinned the most. This story is about the awareness of the heart. The woman knew her heart, and she knew she was a sinner, and she didn't try to hide it. Simon was also a sinner and very much in need of a God and very much in need of a Savior. Was blind to his own sin, and he didn't know, and you know what? And now he's missing salvation. She's getting salvation. He's missing it because he was not aware of his own heart's condition in that situation. We're all sinners. Her sin was known. Simon's sins were hidden except to God. Both were bankrupt, and they could not pay back the debt that God, they owed God. Forgiveness is a gift of God's grace, church. Forgiveness is a gift of God's grace. The woman accepted that gift, but Simon missed it. Now, for the third character in this story. This is, I'll continue on in Luke. Then he turned, which is Jesus, to the woman and said, but he's still talking to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash dust from my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she's anointed my feet with her rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. Hallelujah. First of all, I want to stop right there. I'll cry. Her sins are many. He didn't say, that's forgiven, that's forgiven, and this section over here is forgiven, but we'll keep this over here. These aren't forgiven. We'll work on those later. No, her sins were forgiven. Every one of her notorious sins, and he says, and they were many, were forgiven. Hallelujah. They were forgiven. Was I done reading that? I don't think so. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven, so she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only a little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. And the men at the table said among themselves, who's this man that goes around forgiving sins? And listen to this. And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Now go into peace. Go into peace. The third character in this story is a forgiving savior. Every person needs a forgiving savior. We do. We Christians, we need the forgiving savior. Hallelujah, he's forgiven us of our sins and we live in that. We live in that. We're joyful and it takes that burden, that burden we talked about, it just ticked it off their shoulders. Praise God. I don't remember how you guys were, but I remember as a, a person, I had things hidden. I didn't want my family to find out. And I remember when they would go into a certain room, I'd be scared to death that they might find that hidden thing. And God always directed my mom right to that thing. Beep, 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 beep. Derry, get in here. <laughs> oh, Lord. Why did I keep hiding him? Because I'm a moron. People in sin are crazy. Yeah. People in sin don't have the right mind about them. That's the truth. And here it was. This woman's sins were, exp everyone knew these sins, and God knew their sins as well. But God was willing to forgive all those sins. Hallelujah. He says, there's two mistakes. I, first of all, before we go any further, I want to make sure that we understand, because sometimes this could be confusing. We don't want to make two mistakes here. Number one, the woman was not saved because of her tears or because of the gift. Amen? She was not saved because of the things. She was saved, but Jesus even said so. It's because of her faith she is saved. She trusted Jesus to forgive her. I mean, no one else would forgive her. But Jesus says, I forgive you. And she trusted him for that, and she was saved. Hallelujah. And out of that came, I want to bless you. I want to thank you, God. You know, you're not saved by your gifts, but you're saved by the faith, and then God bless, and then you just want to bless God with everything that you have. And so that's what God did right here. So no amount of good deeds or gifts can save you. And Titus, it says this, 3, 4, 7. But when God, our Savior, revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because of the righteous things that we do, but because of his mercy, he washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of his grace, he declared us righteous. Because of his grace, unmerited favor. 
You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it because of his grace. Unmerited favor. I, was, I just want to bless you. Just like that guy who gave, he blessed him. He says, ah, I have faith. I, I love you. And here, your debt's wiped free. Jesus has unmerited faith and grace in our lives. Because of that, we're set free. Because of his grace, he declared us righteous and gave us confidence that we will inherit the eternal life. The second thing we don't want to make a mistake is this. Nor should we think that she was saved because of love. What do you mean by that? Think of it this way. She wasn't saved because of God's love, and she wasn't saved because of her love for God. The Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So God loves the whole world. The Bible also says this. He says, God does not, is not willing that any should perish, but that everyone would come into a, a eternal life, but not everyone will. So because of God's love, yes, we, we, can, we can receive salvation, but because of his love, we are not saved. And because you may love God, you have a feeling for God, you are not saved. It's by faith in what he did for your life and that you repent from your sins. That's when salvation comes to our life. Amen? So if someone ever says, oh, you know, lots of people weigh the good and the bad. Uh, Islam religion does that. They, they try their best to do the good things and all that stuff. They do all the nine pillars that the, their law tells them to do. But in the very end, if, if they have this huge pile of good things and they have just a little pile of bad, they, they feel like they could stand before Allah and Allah says, come on in. But the thing is this, about Allah, the Bible, uh, their Bible says, he could say, mm, I don't feel like you could come in. So there's never an assurance for these people to be eternally saved. That's why Jesus Christ is so, wow, I'll take that. I'll take that. Hallelujah. He will forgive. And there's no doubt about it, which I'll go into later. So I, I got to get going on this because I don't want to spend all the time on this because you all know this. Amen? But the reason why I say it to you like this again and again so you and I can go out and talk to a world and let them know this so we can explain it to them in such a way that they can understand it. Amen? So God loves us. And not because his love or we saved us, because we trust him to take away our sins and ask him to forgive us. That's how we're saved. For by grace you've been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not the works, lest any of you should boast. And the second part of that, I like the New Living Translation. I'll just read it to you. It says this, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God, a gift. Salvation is, this is the part I really love. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So guys, does that mean we could be bad and still, you know, we trust God, ask him to forgive us for our sins, and we repent of, our li of the sins of our life, you are saved. Not just some, all across the board. All of them, though they be many, like this woman. Hallelujah. Grace is love that paid a price, and Jesus paid that price. This woman was saved because she repented of her sins. Uh, how did this woman know she was truly forgiven? I'll go through this quickly. How many of you guys would like to know, how do I know if I'm really saved? Who's ever heard that? You go to the hospital, and you see people on their dying bed, and this is what they say. You ask them, do you know Jesus Christ, and do you know that you're going to go to heaven? I want to know. I want to know. It happens all the time. You want to know how you can know? This is how the woman knew. Jesus says, you are, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. You're saved. Jesus told her. She knew it. So all these Pharisees could have gone to her and just said, oh, no, you haven't done this, you haven't done this, you haven't washed your hands properly, you haven't, there's still dirt on your feet, whatever what crazy thing they had. No, she says, Jesus said I was saved. <laughs> That's what you cling to, the word of God. Not your emotions, not these things, the word of God. Let me give you some words of God. You want to hear some words of God? This is found in Isaiah 118. Come now, let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them white as wool. You ever picture yourself like in a white garment and there's blood all over you? You could try and wash it all you want, but all it will do is bleed and throughout the fabric and you can never get that out. I'm telling you, Jesus says, I will wash you white as snow. It's like a brand new robe. I don't take it off. I wash it. I cleanse it with my blood and you're made whole. Hallelujah. That's how you can know. Though they are red like scarlet, I will make them white as snow. The second way you can know in Isaiah, it says this, I, yes, I alone will blot out your sins for my own sake and will never, and listen to this, never think of them again. How many of you guys have ever sinned and you ask God to forgive you, but then all of a sudden you start thinking about that sin later on? Huh? You, you kind of, who's reminding you of that? That's the devil. The thing is, Jesus says, I, God says, I'll never remember them. So you can talk to God. Remember that time? God's going, what are you talking about? What are you, what are you talking about? I chose to forget those things. They're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Settled. Gone. You're saved. So that's how you and I can know. The world needs a church that knows who they are and what power they have in the salvation knowledge of Jesus Christ. You are saved. 
walk like a Christian, act like a Christian, be a Christian. All of us, we need to do that and go out into the world with confidence. I am saved because of what Jesus did in my life. I'm saved by faith in God. Amen? Excuse me. In Isaiah 43, it says this. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. <laughs> Let them turn to the Lord and he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God for he will forgive generously. Amen. The next one, Isaiah 43. Brothers, listen. We're here to proclaim that through this man, Jesus, <laughs> there's forgiveness for your sins. Hallelujah. Everyone who believes in him is declared right with God just by believing something the law of Moses can never do. You can't be good. Can't do it. And I love this last one in Hebrews. Obviously, my sins are many, amen? <laughs> but it says this, and I will forgive their wickedness and will never again remember their sins. Dear Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you, Lord. Church, that should grab you. And you should just like, you know, hey, hallelujah. You can walk with your head held high. The devil can come back and say, remember this, remember that? That's when you just turn to him like Smith Wigglesworth did to that little dog. Get out of here. Oh, sorry, dog. <laughs> There's a dog up there. <laughs> You're very good. Very good. He's going to attack me any moment now. <laughs> but hallelujah. Don't let the devil drag you down. Don't go to your deathbed with regret. Go to it saying, hallelujah, Jesus is coming for me. Right. Listen to this. But God's forgiveness is not automatic. You can reject his grace. And there's some people who say, my sin is just... Here's what they say. My sins are too great for God to forgive me. Who's ever heard that? He can't forget that. You know what you think? You think your sin is bigger than God. <laughs> Nothing's bigger than God. Nothing in this world, or universe, seen or unseen, spirit or physical, is bigger than God. And our sins are not bigger than God. God can forgive any and every and all sins. Hallelujah. Let me give you an example. But if you continue to hold on to that thing, you say, no, Lord, you can't forgive it. You can't forgive it. You can't forgive it. Get away from it. It's mine. You know, that sounds crazy, but in reality, we act that way. We do sometimes. We can't let the devil have that victory anymore. True story. Who's ever heard the story of George Wilson? In 1830, he robbed a, uh, a post office and mail. And he might have killed someone, I think. But he robbed this thing for sure. And he killed someone. And so he was given the death sentence. They said, you are going to die by hanging. But Andrew Jackson was the president at the time. And um, he gave him a pardon. I don't know why, I don't know the details, but he gave this man a pardon. And so here's what happened. George refused the pardon. Maybe he didn't like the politics of <laughs> President Anderson. Maybe he didn't like those, I don't know. But he just says, I refuse it. And so here's what the judge said. So what should we do? Should we hang judge? Or should we hang George? Or should we let him go? Because he's been given a pardon from the president for this crime that he has committed. I want to read to you in the writings, because I, I saw a paragraph of it, but when I saw the actual writings of the, the justice, I thought, oh, i got to read that. It's just too good. Uh, Chief Justice uh, John Marshall said, A pardon is a deed to the validity of which delivery is essential. You have to deliver it. It's essential. And delivery is not complete without acceptance. It may then be rejected by the person whom it is tended. And if it is rejected, we have discovered no power in court to force it upon him. In other words, if he refused it, no pardon, George was hanged. True story. Jesus offers pardon for every one of our sins. There's not a sin too great, not a sin too small, not a sin too ugly, not a sin that you just seem like, I can't get over it, I can't get over it. Give it to God. God can forgive you for that sin. God can heal you from that. And his word says, I won't remember that sin. So you don't remember it either. Why should we remember something that God has forgotten? Amen? Let's not remember those things. The Bible says that he casts it into the sea of forgetfulness. He separates it as far as the east is from the west. He's trying to make a very, very pointed point here. Your sins are gone. My blood is just so powerful. There's nothing that can escape it in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The second segment here, and this is the second part I want to talk about. So now, I just wanted to set the, the stage for number one. We have, 
we have our sins uh, ready to be forgiven by God. I say that very awkwardly, but God wants to forgive us of every sin. And God wants you to know this, church, if your sins are forgiven, you've been set free. There's a song that I, I've, I've been trying to find the, the music to, but uh, I, I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. And it's such a beautiful song. And it's called, You're Not Guilty Anymore. You're Not Guilty Anymore. And it goes into, it says, though you may have shame and you have all these things in your life, you're not guilty anymore. And then in the middle, in the bridge of the song, he start, he, it's God declaring, you are righteous, you are holy, you're mine. And he starts giving a new identity to the person who says, my sins are so terrible. My sins are so terrible. He says, I've given you a new identity. He just sings it again and again and again over him. You are righteous, you are holy. And it's all because of our faith in Jesus Christ, trusting him to forgive us of our sins. Amen? Hallelujah. What a wonderful thing for the world to know. The world needs to know this, that Jesus forgives sins. They, don't just say it like that. Just says, God will forgive you, take that heavy burden off of you. He will. He will lift it. Hallelujah. Now the second part. Christians, once you've been forgiven... We have an obligation. Actually, we have a command to forgive others who have wronged us. Amen? Let me give you some scriptures. This is found in Matthew 18. Then Peter came to him, which is Jesus Christ, and he asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who has sinned against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date. So Jesus, right now, he goes into a story to try to explain this. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owed to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. Forget it. It was a million dollars. Forget it. But when that man left the king, can you imagine how joyous he must have felt? He went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. And when some of the other servants saw this, they were upset. So they went to the king and told him everything that had happened. And then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That is what my heavenly father would do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and your sisters from your heart. Wow, that's pretty powerful. That's very, very powerful. Four points I want to make out of this. Point number one, stop counting. When Peter came to Jesus, he says, Jesus, how many times should I forgive? Should I forgive seven? See, to Jesus, I meant to Peter, that was a huge step. Because back then, the Pharisees said this, you only have to forgive three times. The fourth one, you don't have to. And that's what they taught. And so Peter thought, well, I'll just double it and I'll look good in Jesus' eyes. And Jesus says, no, no, not seven times. Seventy times seven. Was Jesus telling him to keep a counter there and keep track of it? No, he wasn't. He says, I want you to have a lifestyle of forgiveness. You're just constantly forgiving. You're constantly, when people come to you, forgive them. You don't hold on to that sort of thing. Don't keep it. Stop the counting. Stop counting, Peter. Listen to this. Jesus doesn't want us to keep score. You know, the Bible says that love does not keep track of wrong, does it? That's, it just so matches up with God. It's just so real. God does not keep track of our wrong. He forgives it when we ask him to. And that's what true love is. When you and I, someone has wronged us. And we've been asked to forgive them, or we should forgive them even if they don't be asked. Forgive them. Make it a lifestyle. Make it a part of your life, of who you are. That's the first point. That's what Christians should do. The second point is this. Our debt is very great, and we've already discovered that a little bit. Our debt is very great. And Jesus wants us to live a lifestyle of forgiveness because we have been forgiven much. So you may think you haven't, but any little thing that would drag you to hell 
for eternity is much. Amen? I don't care what it is. That's a debt you can't pay. And so you better say, Lord, I, I need to find someone who can pay, and only one, and that's Jesus Christ in the blood. You've been forgiven much. The first servant is a mere day. That first servant, he was a mere day wage earner. In other words, he, he lived by day to day, kind of like a lot of us do, don't we? Just paycheck to paycheck. That's how this guy did it. But yet he's saying, he owed this guy, in today's standards, when you look at it, it's close to $100 million. How many of you guys can pay off $100 million? I know we have billionaires around here, but how many of you guys are billionaires in here? If so, I do want to meet you. <laughs> I do. I have some plans. But the thing is this. This guy was a day way earner. He, only, he worked day to day to day, and that's how he got his paycheck. There's no way he could pay this thing back. He could never hope to. And, the prison was, and this prison here, it was to show his utter de uh, dependency upon someone to have to help him. He says, oh, I've got to have someone to help me, otherwise I'm going to prison. It was hopeless. He was hopeless without grace. He's hopeless without grace, but yet he received grace from that king. And grace flowed. His entire debt was forgotten. Listen to this. Now, how do we apply that to us? Our sins and debt is utterly hopeless. It is utterly hopeless. We need someone who can pay it, and that's Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you. Get to know him. <laughs> We've talked about it before. Get to know him. It's all in who you know. It's Jesus Christ. Third point is this. Un unforgiveness doesn't pay. What do you mean? Well, remember that first servant? After he's been forgiven the $100 million, he's walking out whistling, <laughs> comes across this guy right here who owed him maybe a thousand bucks, grabs him by the throat, the Bible says. He says, pay me that money. Pay me that money now. And the guy did the same thing he did. Please give me some more time. I'll pay it back. He says, no, you're going to prison because I don't have it. I am mad at you. I'm ticked off. Throw him into prison. And this guy was in prison. It doesn't pay. Listen to this. Can that guy pay him back when he's in prison? He cannot. So he's stuck in prison forever and ever and ever. He's stuck there. And that, and that guy who's owed $1,000, he's never going to see it. He's never going to see it. We, when we want, when we won't forgive people, listen to this, when we won't forgive people, you know what that's like? It's like you grabbing them by the throat and throwing them into prison. I refuse to forgive you. You just threw someone in prison. A prison of your making. See, this isn't a prison that the, the good king Threw, had this guy thrown in. This is a prison that that first servant had him thrown in. Listen, I, I just came across my heart right now, but there might be someone here today saying, you know what? My heart's so full of unforgiveness, I can't forgive him. What you're getting ready to ask me to do is just impossible for me. The devil's working on right now, whispering in a lot of people's hearts and lives to saying, you cannot forgive. You cannot forgive. You cannot forgive what this has happened. Hold on to it. You deserve it. They wronged you. No, not until they've done this, not until they've done that, not until they've made it up for a couple of years or what have you. There's no way. Don't forgive, don't forgive. You can't do it. You've tried it before. It won't work this time. I'm here to break that lie. I'm here to break it and throw out that spirit of deceit right now in Jesus' name. That's a lie because God wants us to live in a lifestyle of forgiveness because that's the church. That's the power of the church. That's where God's power flows through when we forgive because we've been forgiven. Then if we forgive, that's when power is going to start flowing. Hallelujah. When we won't forgive, we throw people into prison and nothing changes between us. Nothing changed between us. If, I, if I'm mad at you and I won't forgive you, nothing will ever change between us because I've got you thrown in prison. I won't forgive you, even if you want to be forgiven. Second thing is this. When we won't forgive, we forget the enormity of our forgiven debt. I, think about that. Can you imagine the day that you stand before God and God says, you didn't forgive him. I gave forgive you all this and you wouldn't forgive him that? Who are you? Now I want you to know this whole story here is not about salvation. It's about the relationship amongst believers. He's not going to lose his salvation for throwing this guy into prison. I'm going to give you a little bit of story on that. And that's the final point and that's this. A double disaster. A double disaster. When the merciful master learned what had happened... You know what he did? He had that servant, not just thrown into prison, he had that, pri uh, that servant tortured. <laughs> that sounds a lot worse in prison, doesn't it? <laughs> he, had that, he had that first uh, servant tortured until he had paid his debt. It says this. Well, first of all, I want you guys to know this. We don't lose our salvation. This, isn't, this is a different penalty here. When Jesus says, uh, Jesus says, though, this is powerful. This is very powerful. If you won't forgive a person of their, uh, the things that they've done to you, what you've done is uh, 
I'm going to have you tortured. Can I just put it plain like that? I don't know how to put it other than that. When we don't forgive someone what they've done to us, we are going to be tortured. What are you talking about, Terry? I, you know, I've never been tortured, and I still can't forgive mom for what she did to me, or for, I can't forgive my brother for what he, you know, he ate my Cheerios, whatever it may be, or some stupid thing. And in the light of eternity, that's just how stupid that is, a lot of this stuff. But this, we don't, Jesus says this is very powerful because it relates to our, our health and our mind. See, when you and I don't forgive, the doctors have already said this again and again, we harbor all these ill feelings, we harbor all this unforgiveness inside of us, this anger and all these things, and what happens? It tortures us. People who won't forgive, who just, I'm holding on to this sort of thing, it rots away their own bones. It causes diseases. Doctors today have already proven that an unforgiven heart will cause diseases in your life. I believe a lot of diseases today are in people because they refuse to forgive what's happening around them. They refuse to believe. Hallelujah. Just as a torture affects the servant, the spirit of unforgiveness will affect yours and my body and our soul and our emotions and everything about us. There's no joy in that. What joy is there to hold on to something? I mean, how fun is that? You're still angry at them. I'm not, I'm just, I mean, you ever have joy? No, I'm, I'm busy being angry right now because I, they, they, they didn't be wrong and I'm going to hold it against them. Oh, come on, let's go have some fun. No, I'm, I'm busy being home making sure they stay in jail. That's exactly what we do. You can't do that. You will rot on the inside. You will probably capture some disease and that's the truth. Should I just say it? When you're... Uh, what, what, what is it? Your immune system, when it is weak, you catch all kinds of diseases that are out there ready to grab you. Unforgiveness weakens your immune system. So we want to make sure that we're forgiving, forgiving people. So we, <laughs> amen, I don't want to be tortured with that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oops, I scrolled clear down to the top up here. Praise the Lord. Hi. Hi. Thank you very much. Hallelujah. Doctors of all kinds warn us of many diseases, uh, representing bitterness, unforgiveness, uh, hate, anger, self-pity, self-centeredness. All these things will rot you out and you will capture some sort of disease in some way. You just, your life is miserable as well. Your life is miserable as well. The story, let me give you two stories. There's a story of this man. He went to the hospital and in this hospital was this woman. She was dying of a disease of her lungs. Her lungs were like leather and they were shrinking up. And uh, he went in and he gave her scripture after scripture after scripture about healing. Does that boost your faith? Yeah, it does because faith comes by hearing the word of God. And then you have faith to believe to be healed. And that's why we go into these hospitals and we give scriptures or any place we go. Give them scriptures that God loves and that God wants to heal them. He's still the same God. And then all of a sudden, he's, he laid hand on her and he prayed for her and nothing is happening. Nothing is happening. He just keeps praying, praying. So then they go home and she's still the same. But then he, he thinks about this. It bothers him. Listen to this. Number one, kudos to that man that this woman is not healed that it bothers him. So many times we pray, in the name of Jesus, be healed. And we just walk away and we never get that thought again. Do we? There's nothing wrong with continually asking, Lord, bring healing, bring healing. It's just like that woman just keeps knocking. Judge, judge, I want justice, I want justice. Well, you know what? God says, be, be persistent like that. So this guy was persistent. He's going, why isn't she healed? What's wrong? What's going on? And then he started praying to God. And here's another thing. He prayed to God. Why wasn't she healed? What, a, what an audacity thing to ask. God, why aren't they healed? That's okay to ask that. Can I say that? It's okay to ask it. And so he's praying and he's trusting God because God, I know you love people. And so as he's praying, all of a sudden, the Lord dropped this scripture in his heart and it was uh, Proverbs and it says this. Um, Proverbs four eighteen, The human spirit can endure a sick body, but who can bear a crushed spirit? Let me say that again. The human spirit can endure a sick body. You can endure a sick body, but who can bear a crushed spirit? So even though this physical body gets hurt, but when, the, when your spirit gets hurt, man, you, you can't bear it. It's hard. And here's a woman. So the Lord gave that to him. So he went to her. He says, I want to read you a scripture. He read it to her. And he says, is there unforgiveness in your life? Is there someone right now you're holding, that you're very angry with? And she says, yes. My m grandmother was in a wheelchair, and a man came and took advantage of her. And I will never forgive that man. Never forgive that man. He says, well, you've you got to forgive him. I believe that this right here that just crushed you, you got to let him go. You can't stay guard above oh, this prison right here, otherwise you're going to rot away. So he says, let it go. So she says, okay, I can do it. So she started praying, and then all of a sudden she just started breaking. Started breaking, her husband was there, and they both started breaking. For the next several minutes, they just started confessing sins to each other and to God. And then he left, and that woman was healed right away. 
because of unforgiveness, she was holding that person in prison. But the whole thing was, the whole time she was holding that person, she was holding herself as well. Another story, and I'll make this, I've told this story before. Pastor Cho in South Korea, uh, he had this woman, a uh, beautiful woman, but half of her face had like drooped. It was like uh, disfigured. And uh, she came to him. She was saying, will you please pray for me for healing? So he prayed for her, put his hands on her, and the Lord says, you know, there's something, she wouldn't be healed, but there's something wrong here. And the Lord says, ask her about, is she holding ill, is she unforgiving someone right now? Is there unforgiveness in her heart? And so he asked her, and then she just started bawling. And what the story was is how her family had treated her, and they treated her bad, very bad, like a slave, worse than a slave. And she would not forgive them. He says, well, maybe you can pray for them then. And she goes, okay, I'll try praying for him. And so as she prayed for him, God broke that spirit of unforgiveness in her. Then she says, I forgive them. She says, Lord, I, I just give them to you. Here's the keys to their jail. Have at them, whatever you want. And at that moment, he says, he looked up and he saw her face come back to normal at that moment. The spirit of unforgiveness will block things in yours and my life. You, we think we're hurting them. We're destroying ourselves. We're destroying ourselves. So we need to be forgiving. We need to have that spirit of forgiveness in our lives. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. God said that unforgiveness will torture us as long as we carry that spirit. That's why in verse 35 it says this, that's why my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from the heart. So that's what it's talking about right there. If you refuse to forgive, it's not talking about he's going to take away salvation. It just says you're going to rot away. You're going to rot away. You're not going to have prayers answered. All because of un, a spirit of unforgiveness right there. And the last point is this. The ser, that servant, and this is a point that a lot of people don't talk about. That person, that second servant, where's he at? He's still in prison. When we refuse to forgive people, we forget that that person is still in prison. Sometimes when we refuse to forgive someone else or give them pardon, you know what happens? There's things in their life that they cannot receive healing from. I don't mean just physical body. I'm talking about even salvation. Can you imagine a pastor holding a grudge against someone so bad that that person says, well, I, I don't want anything to do with God, you know, all because that pastor won't forgive them. But the pastor came out and just said, you know, hey, I love you more than I love this situation. I, it's forgiven. Forget about it. I love you. Let's go. You know what? That releases that person to say, I can accept Jesus. Isn't that amazing? See, it, also, it holds us captive when we unforgive people. We will not forgive them. But it also holds captive. That person is still in prison. We cannot leave people in prison church amen we cannot leave people in prison so if i can well actually i don't have anyone here maybe jimmy could you come up and play guitar for me you always know when the pastor's ready to quit when they, they call someone up to play the guitar <laughs> it's like oh look he's going for the guitar wake up wake up so are you keeping someone bound up through your unforgiveness like I said, as I was nearing the end of this lesson, it just kept going, this, these faces just kept appearing before my mind's eye, and I kept thinking, why? Oh, God, I'm holding a, 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 even the tiniest grudge against that person. I fake it around in front of them. I'm, eh, everything's fine. But behind their back, oh, I can't stand you, you know? What, what's happening here? I could be hindering that person from something and breaking in their life. Pastor Jack Hafer gave this one story, and, and in the story, uh, he talked about um, a relative of his. His name was Joe. Uh, Joe was a Christian, but then all of a sudden he says, I don't want anything to do with God, and he, just, he was very angry, very bitter. But then uh, they lived far away, Pastor Jack, so they went to visit him. And when they went to visit him, um, Jack thought, well, I'm just going to do everything I can just to be a normal person. I'm not going to talk church. I'm not going to talk things. I'm not going to try and save him. I'm just going to be normal and let this guy, because I just know that would just send him up the wall, and he won't receive it. So he did everything he could to be kind, to be nice, to be fun, and all that stuff. And this went on for years, years. Finally, one day, this is what happened. Uh, he was sitting there, and the guy wouldn't receive his kindness, wouldn't receive anything about him, just kept rejecting him, was nasty to Jack, and even arrogant. Finally, Jack, in his heart, says, fine, have it that way. Have it your way. I, I have nothing to do with you. I wrote you off. I tried. I tried and tried and tried for years. And then uh, he forgot all about it. So one Valentine's Day, he was at home a couple years later. And in this Valentine, um, it was a Valentine from that Joe's daughter to Pastor Jack's daughter. They were conversing back and forth. 
And, uh, and in doing that, uh, he opened it up and it says, uh, I want to thank you so much. It was, the Valentine was cute, but then it says, I want to thank you so much for still praying for my dad's salvation. And all of a sudden, the Lord just, Jack right here, and he says, you've never prayed for him once. You pastor. <laughs> you never prayed for him once. And all of a sudden, Jack goes, oh, God, forgive me. I'm sorry. And so he started praying for him. And then all of a sudden, he found it in his heart and says, Lord, I release him. I, I, I have no right to hold a grudge against him. I have no right to be angry like that. Lord, forgive me for my sins. I release him to you now, Lord. Bless him. Bless him. Well, a couple months later, all of a sudden, he got his phone call. He and his wife, and it was Joe on the other line. And Joe had this excited voice, sound about him. And finally, he just blurted out, almost yelled it. He goes, I'm back with Jesus. I've given my life to Jesus. He's forgiven me. Hallelujah. I'm back. And Jack just said, uh, he just started crying, just started clapping. and says, praise God. Hallelujah. And the whole point was this. Then the Lord put it in his heart. He says, when you forgave him, that released him for me to work in his life. Amen. So church, we have no right to hold anything against anybody. God has forgiven us a whole bunch of things. Does that mean you have to go and be their best buddies? No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. You know what I'm saying? You know, you forgive someone for wrecking your car. Do you let them borrow your car again? I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. But the thing is this. Don't hold these feelings. And, and, and the scripture actually even says from the heart. From the heart. We could, we could disguise everything just like Simon. He could disguise everything. But it was in his heart and his mind that he thought these things. And it's in the heart. When we Christians do that and we can't give that up, then all of a sudden we are damaging ourselves and we're holding that person in prison and we don't have that right. Amen? God has called us to be a people who set people free through the spirit of forgiveness. Through the spirit of forgiveness. Hallelujah. Do you insist on returning them forgiveness for others' unkindness or injustice or rejection? Don't. The way they worship maybe. Or maybe the, the different styles that's going on around them. Sometimes we do that. Even those little things like that. Church, I, you know, I, there's things that happen even within a church that I don't like the way these things are going here. Well, pray about it. Instead of just sitting there and just harboring and ill feeling, you know, pray about it. God wants unity in this church so much because there's no power without the unity. There's no healing without the unity. There's no outgoing without the unity. We'll just be mad at each other and not like each other and all those sort of things. And we are worthless and powerless. That's not what God wants in this church. God doesn't want that in any church. Amen. So maybe there's something that in our lives, even as a church, and I'm, I'm not pointing this at anyone, I promise you. I promise you. I'm just saying in our lives, and even as a pastor and a staff, is there something that's going on that, that would cause this body not to function the way God wants it to in the power? Maybe there's a disease within because we refuse. We're holding grudges. Let's get rid of it. Amen? Let's get rid of that right now. Hallelujah. Jesus taught we need his discipline. Jesus can break any bonds and forgiveness that we invite him to break. Any bonds of unforgiveness, if we invite him to break, he will break it. You may have done it before. I, you know what? Try it now. <laughs> Do it again. Do it again. Let it be a broken heart. I hope you enjoyed Pastor Terry's message today. If you would like to have more information concerning our church, you can go to www.faithoutreach.cc. On behalf of Faith Outreach Center, this is Roger Vogel saying, God bless.